Thank you, team. Appreciate that. We need to clarify something this morning, though. I'm going to try to help Trent out best I can. By show of hands, how many of you have ever been in a church where you had to use a, a, a funeral home fan? All right, I've got a few of you. There's more than I thought. Drummer man, have you ever been in one of those? Yeah, yeah I know. I, every service. <laughs> I, I thought about one Sunday just turning the air conditioner off in here and setting out fans. So, you know, for those who say, why can't we go back to the way it used to be? Uh, <laughs> so, and put locks on the bathrooms and put a porta potty outside. Uh, my great grandmother's church still has an outhouse at their church. And still, and that is their bathroom. How many of you um, have been in a church? Keep your hands up if you use that fan. Uh, and you can put your hand down when I get to a point that it's not you. Seen that, that brown Sunday school report board hanging on the wall. Man, I think more people raised their hands that time. Wow. What about uh, been in the church? They shout and yell. What is wrong with y'all? Nobody shouts and yells anymore. <laughs> Runs a lap. Okay, then, then y'all should know we did not sing that very first song correctly. You can put your hands down. We mispronounced that in there. And does anybody know what word I'm talking about? Power. What it, what it, all you people with them fans, is, it's pyre, pyre. So, Trent, you learned something new. I mean, I know you're young, so we had to, we got to pronounce that right. And how many of you ever said power seven times in that little section there? I, yep, I grew up with that. The, our, uh, Leonard, our music minister years ago when I was growing up, he'd stop after the first time through. He said, now this time we're going to try something new. And I'm like, we've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, it got to the point in our church where that's the way everybody sang it because they knew he was going to come back to it on the second verse and make you do it. So we got to learn to pronounce power there. So, yes, right. So, hey, this morning we're, um, we're finishing up on the doctrine of God the Father, and we're going to talk about a really easy one and a really good one, the grace of God, and, and how wonderful that is. And we've spent about 14 weeks looking at at the doctrine of God the Father, and we've covered every, just about every aspect. Uh, well, I won't say that. We've covered a lot, but you cannot begin to touch everything about the doctrine of God the Father. I just don't believe that's possible. So uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, and uh, Trey, I, I appreciate you saying what you did about getting a pen, colored markers, and and marking your Bible up. I I try to do that. I keep about four or five colored pencils with me uh, when I'm doing my study time and a, and a pen. And each color means something different to me that I can look at it and I know. If, and if I see something that I really highlight in blue, I know I really need to dig into that. That's kind of one of those things that I say, mm, not quite sure I understand that. So go back and really make sure you study that, Marty. But mark up your Bibles. Uh, and that way, if, you're, if your Bible is marked up, you know you're using it, and you're reading it, and you're studying it. So I would encourage you to always have God's Word uh, with you. Nothing against the new electronic devices and things like that, but to me, and it may be just because I'm old, but I like the feel of it. I like the feel of the pages. That's books in general for me. Uh, I like the feel of it. I like the, the weight of it, the feel of the pages. I like the smell of it, and I like marking, uh, marking it up. So I'm going to throw that in. not going to charge you extra for that this morning. So but let's say this, this week you find a really, really good deal on a brand new car, one that is almost unbelievable how great the price is. And if you know, if you look around right now, the prices of cars are the prices of about everything right now is unbelievable. But let's just say this week that you find a brand new car at 75% off sticker price. How many are you going to buy? It's brand spanking new. How many are you going to probably buy that car at 75% off? Great. Well, you go in, you sign the paperwork, you get it all done, and you go out and you get in it and you turn the key and nothing happens, not even a sound. And you realize, 
I just bought a car for 75% off that does not have an engine. And you go back in and you say, now, wait a minute. I just bought this car on site. No questions asked for 75% off. And the salesman says, you're exactly right. You got a great deal. And you can say, but it doesn't have an engine. And he's going to say, well, you could have paid extra for that. And you could have got it. And then you go out and you think, well, I can't push this thing. It's too heavy. I can't get it up a hill. I can't do anything with it. When we look at God, it's the same way. We can look at everything against us and everything in our life that we deal with, and we realize we just can't do it because the power is not in us. The power is in God. He's the one that gets things going. He's the one that is the power, the engine. He's the motivator. He's the one that controls everything, just like the engine in that car. That's what's going to make it go. If you want your life to go, allow God to be the power in it and allow God to show his grace in you, through you, so that in turn you can bring him glory and you can show grace to other people. You get it? When we are in tune with God and when we, his power is our, we allow his power to be us in what powers us, we are allowed to show grace to other people much easier. And that's what we need to do as Christians. Sometimes I think we tend to judge too much and we want to be the engine and we want to be the power and the say all and be all when God's just saying, look, show a little grace. I showed grace to you. Show grace to other people. That's why I think that, you know, God doesn't owe us anything. But in his grace, he gives us everything. That's what 2 Corinthians, uh, the 12th chapter, the 9th verse says. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. God's grace is sufficient. I don't need anything else. And God didn't owe me anything. But in grace... He makes it sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient. Grace is possible because of Christ. That's why grace is possible. It's because of Christ. Grace is possible because of the sacrifice that God made on the cross when he allowed his son Jesus to hang on the cross for each and every one of us. That's what made grace possible. God's goodness is only available because of his grace. If he, was, if he never showed us any grace, there'd never be any salvation. There'd never be any saving power. We worship Jesus because Jesus dealt with the one thing that separated us from God. And what is the one thing? Sin. Jesus dealt with it so that God could provide us grace. God says, I'm not going to do it. But Jesus, being fully man and fully God, goes to the cross to pay for the a price of sin, the one thing that separated us from God that God would not deal, would not allow, and that's sin. But because of Jesus, grace is possible. Romans 5, uh, you look in that, in that chapter and we have a contrast between the first Adam and the second Adam. And you may say, well, I didn't know there were two Adams. There's really not. But when you look at the first Adam and in the context of what that scripture says, because of one man, sin, one man being Adam, the first man, sin came to all because of one man. But the second Adam, and we must understand that Adam is a Jesus-like figure. In, in, in this manner, that because of one man, sin came to all. But because of the second Adam, Jesus, salvation is possible for all. One man brought it all on, but one man can take care of it. One man can save us through his grace and mercy and us placing our faith in him. Thanks to grace... Here's another thing. Do you know the scripture says we don't die? Christians don't die. Do you know what the, the scripture says that we as Christians do? We sleep. That's what it says. We don't die. 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, the 51st verse says that we sleep. 
I mean, I'm not, I don't, I'm ready to die. I just don't want to do it today, if I'm honest with you. But some good sleep would be great, wouldn't it? Anybody that has children can say amen to that. Anybody has children, right there is your opportunity to run a lap and scream and shout and yell. I, I tell folks, uh, you know, the greatest thing about having that when you get to be a man or a woman of a certain age and you have to go through that when you hit 50, I tell everybody the prep's horrible, but the sleep is fantastic. There's nothing like that sleep. But God says, the scripture says, we don't die. We just go to sleep. And I, I don't ever remember painful sleep, you know? When I really get to sleep, I feel rejuvenated. I feel good. And that's what God will do for us. We just go to sleep. We just take a nap. God's grace is common because it's available to everyone. There's common grace. Now, let me separate this out here. There is, there is common grace. Well, what is common grace? Sunshine. Rain. That's common grace. That's what the Scripture says. Scripture says that God makes rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Makes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. But as children of God, as people who place their faith in him, we get that extra grace. You can walk around. Here's one thing. It's because God loves everybody. God created all of us in his image, and he wants a relationship with him. And he shows some grace on everybody, but exceptional grace on those who place their faith in him. What if God says, I don't care and don't love you enough that I'm not even going to allow the sun to shine on you if you're not a child of mine? I'm not going to let any rain fall on you or your property or whatever because I don't love you and I don't have grace for you. You see, there's common grace, but then there's exceptional grace that those who place their faith in him receive. And that's why we as Christians ought to thank him daily for his grace. Daily thanking him for his grace. God's grace gives mercy. Now, there's a difference in grace and mercy. They're, they are totally different. Grace is something that you get that is undeserved. Mercy <clears throat> is identifying with the bad. Identifying with the misery. Ephesians, the second chapter, the fourth and fifth verse, if you want to flip there or it's on the screen, says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. I, you, did not deserve God's grace. We have been given something that we did not deserve. But thankfully, because God did not want to deal with sin, and that's what separated us, Jesus went to the cross for us. It is his grace that, is, that saves us. His grace, and we don't deserve it. If we got what we deserved, we would not like it. It would not be good. How many of you ever looked at a parent or a grandparent or something and you just got a spanking and, and uh, some of y'all got spankings and then some of us got whoopings. There's a distinct difference. And some of y'all just got, I tell you, you go stand in that corner right over there. You got a time out for the next five minutes. How many of you ever said, I didn't deserve that? No, I'll give you what you deserve. We don't want what we deserve. But grace does not come, or grace must come before mercy. Grace has got to come before mercy. God must deal with our sin first, and then he can fix the hurt. He's got to deal with the sin first. First John, that's why John says in First John, the first, uh, first chapter, the ninth verse, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's good enough to do that. He is gracious enough. Once we are cleaned up, he'll fix the hurt. 
He'll take care of it. We just have to come to him, place our faith in him, and ask for forgiveness of our sin. Let him deal with the sin, and then he'll clean us up and fix us. Lamentations, the third chapter, the 23rd verse, said God's mercies are new every morning. We don't get secondhand, hand-me-down mercies. We don't get that. We get new every morning. When you wake up, you get new. Man, wouldn't that be nice if you woke up every morning and everything you had was brand new every morning? But God's mercies are new every morning. He's identifying with it. God is saying, I see that hurt. I identify with it. I know what you're going through. And as my child, I can help fix that if you will just let me. You see, we have to let him do it. Why is it new every day? Because here's why his mercies are new every day. It's not because of what we do. It's because God is so satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross that he's going to hand out new mercies every morning because he's so satisfied with what his son did. People, you know what? How many of y'all have ever been in court? Now, I'm not going to ask you to get up and testify. I mean, you know, a speed, I'm going to say, let's speed and ticket or something like you've decided to go to court. Have you ever seen anybody throw themselves at the feet of the judge and say, judge, just give me justice? No. What do they say? Judge, show me mercy. You know, that's what we're doing when we come to God. We say, God, just show me mercy. Just show me grace. Don't show me justice. Because if he, if he acted justice on us, it would be ugly. How many of you with your families or your best friends or whatever, how many of you, say there's some kind of falling out or something goes on, how many of you want your friend to act in justice against you? Or how many of us want us, them to act in mercy and grace? Maybe it was an honest mistake that we made. I'd much rather have mercy and grace than I have justice. The funny thing is the only time we want justice is when we're on the giving end. But what we ought to do is flip it around and we ought to be on the grace giving end and when the way we deal with people. None of us are perfect, and God shows grace to us. We should always show grace to people. Show them what Jesus is like. Be an example of what Jesus is like. God's grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for us. 2 Corinthians, let me flip over there. 2 Corinthians Second Corinthians 9, 8. God's got something for everything we need. Second Corinthians, the ninth chapter, the eighth verse says this. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good Work. You see, God's got something for everything. Everything we need, God can take care of it because his grace is sufficient. And here's the thing. God's checks don't bounce. God's checks don't bounce. When God makes a promissory note to you, when God makes a promise, when you can read in the scripture the promises God's made, they are always fulfilled. Not one promise in the scripture did God break his promise. His checks don't bounce. His grace is inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. When we get saved, God supplies everything we need for a spiritual life and spiritual growth. Why do you think we have small groups in Bible studies? 
It's an opportunity for us to come together in God's grace and learn and grow in our spiritual life so that we are stronger Christians, so that we grow and we realize just how sufficient God's grace is. Second Peter, the uh, third chapter, the 18th verse says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. We probably live pauper-like Christian lives because we fail to grow in the knowledge and wisdom of God. So we're comfortable with just going down and saying that magical prayer that has never been said in the Bible. It's never reported anywhere in the Bible about this magical prayer that saves you. But we're, we're okay with just saying that prayer and taking our seat and doing nothing else. Never cracking a Bible because we believe that I'm saved. I don't have to do anything else. And that's just not true. We are to grow in the knowledge and wisdom of God so that we become more like him. And when we become more like him, we begin to live like him. And when we begin to live like him, people begin to see who we are and who we represent. And people say, We're, what are, you're different. What's, why are you so different? And then I have an opportunity to point to the cross and say, it's nothing about me. It's all about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Grace teaches us how to live. God's grace teaches us how to live. Look at uh, Titus. Boy, that's one that'll throw you in it. Titus, the second chapter, the 11th through the 14th verse says this. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Grace teaches us how to live. It teaches us how to live. If I look at that, it teaches me to turn away from unrighteousness, ungodliness. It teaches me to seek after the things of God. And when I seek after the things of God, the worldly things, the sinful things, start taking a back seat. And God's grace shines through that. His grace teaches us how to live. We can't do it on our own. Check this out, Galatians. I'll flip over to Galatians, the second chapter, the 20th verse. <clears throat> 20th verse says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's about God. God did it all. I can't do anything. It's the grace of God that I can live. It's the grace of God that saved me. It is the grace of God. It's God. But if I look at verse 21, look what 21 says. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Look, it's all about God. If it's about me, if I can do it, then what Jesus did on the cross is worthless. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about what he did. And if I think I can do it, then I think I'm Jesus. And I nullify what he did. He teaches us how to live. Maybe you want to do like the Galatians there. And what was going on is there was this big argument about the circumcised or the uncircumcised. Well, you got to follow this law. You got to check this box. To be qualified to be a follower of God and do this, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to eat certain foods. You got to do this. You got to be circumcised, uncircumcised. When the bottom line is Jesus and what he did, because 
circumcision, if I look at that one thing, was a thing that man did. And if man can do it, Jesus, we don't need you. That's what the scripture is saying. It's not about conformity. It's not about the rules. Now, get, don't, don't get me wrong. Rules are, are good. Rules are good. But it's, when it comes to salvation, it's not about rules. Here's what I like to say. Being a follower of Jesus is not about what I can't do, but it's about what I can do. Because with Christ in me, I can do all things. When Christ is in me and I am living for Christ, through Christ, and he is living in me, then it doesn't matter all that sinful stuff because I don't want that. I can do all things and have just as much fun and feel a whole lot better the next morning when I allow God to live through me than the one who lets the world live through them. There's a ton of people laying at home right now, laying in bed. Oh, I can't believe I did what I did last night. But look at us. I can't believe what I did last night. I'm in church. God's mercies are new every morning. And that ought to excite us. Here's a look at flip over Galatians, the fifth chapter. Not about conformity, checking outward boxes. Galatians, the fifth chapter, the first verse. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. God did what he did for freedom to turn us loose, to set us free from the slavery of sin. God did that for freedom, not because of rules. Again, Rules are good. But you know who gives me the power and the motivation to follow the rules? God does. Where's your motivation? What motivates you and, and what cultivates your relationship with God? It's kind of like this. I like, I like that, that Trey and Rachel are new the ways. It gives me great examples. Because I bet you still, Every morning, one of them's cooking breakfast for the other one. Don't shake your head because, but you come over here, somebody's been married about 35 years, 40 years. Uh, I don't smell nothing cooking. <laughs> I remember when Jennifer and I first got married, uh, right away she worked, there was, she started out on day shift a little bit, so I got up. Because being a nurse, she had to be at work by 6.15. I got up and I cooked breakfast. Man, I'm talking a feast. I'm talking about I, I knocked the snot out of them cinnamon roll cans. Bow! Yeah. <laughs> Whop biscuits, you know, I whopped them and they came open. But I would cook breakfast for a while. You come five years down the road, and you know, she would cook dinner when she was off. Nurses working 12-hour shifts and, or anybody working 12-hour shifts, you know, you're just trying to get to the end of the day, get home, get in bed, get ready for the next day. But when she was off, she always cooked, always had meals ready. You come five years down the road, there wasn't many meals. I, now, I know y'all say, can't tell it by looking at you. <laughs> but on top of that, there weren't as many car doors being held open for her either. Matter of fact, she probably felt like she was lucky I didn't drive off and leave her standing there or knock her out of the car driving off before she got in. But how do we cultivate our relationships? It's important that we grow in our knowledge and wisdom of God so that we cultivate that relationship. If we're ever separated and things don't seem, hey, my relationship with God is just not great, it's not because of God. It's because we didn't cultivate it. We didn't seek after him. And trust me, when you start seeking and you start studying, things, your eyes are going to be opened up to things. Knowledge and wisdom of the Bible is going to jump out at you. I just started a new study in my personal time in the book of Daniel, and I'm like seven verses in on the first day, and I'm like, I never knew this. They didn't teach this in my seminary classes. But I'm looking at them, and I'm like, that's incredible in seven verses. I, sp I spent an hour and a half in seven verses. Now, I don't spend an hour and a half every day in Bible study. Don't think, oh, you're such a wonderful Christian. 
I just got lost in it. I would encourage you, spend five minutes a day, five minutes a day, digging in and growing in the knowledge and the wisdom of God. But we've got to cultivate our relationship with God. Last thing, last thing here is God's grace is given on God's terms. Not our terms. They're given on God's terms. Look over at James. James, the uh, fourth chapter. James, the fourth chapter. First six verses. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. We, to those first three verses, we try to fix everything. When the fixer can handle it all, then we just have to get out of the way. But here's the thing we need to know as Christians. You can come right here into this altar. You can sit right where you're at. You can say, God, I'm in this horrible financial situation, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Fix it. And God says, okay, I will. But when you get up from this altar, there's still a financial issue when you walk out of here. Not a financial issue that God created, but a financial issue that we created. And God says, I'll get you out of it, but we got to do it God's way. See, I think sometimes we think we're in a microwave society that when I tell God, okay, here's what I need, five seconds, beep, beep, okay, it should be gone and done and fixed. And I'm not saying God can't do it because he can, but most of the time, our decisions were not based on what God would have us to do. So we're suffering the circumstances. And God says, okay, I'll take care of it, but you've got to follow me and we're gonna learn, you're going to learn through this. Look at verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You got to choose. We have to choose. Do I want to choose God or do I want to choose the world? Because we can't have both. They're at odds with each other. They're in conflict with each other. So we have to choose. It's our choice. Verse 5. Or do you suppose it to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? God is not going to share us with any other spiritual entity. God's jealous. And God will give his spirit to us and it will live in us. But we have to choose. We have to choose. And then God's not going to be your second-hand God. He's the God, the primary God. And he's jealous, and he's not going to give in to any other, any other God that we put in our life. He's just not going to do it. Look at verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. And he opposes the proud. What God's saying, and what that scripture is saying there is that God shows grace to those who humble themselves to him. But if I'm proud, if you're proud, and you think, I can do this on my own. I can make it on my own. I can do it. You know what God's going to say? Okay. Have at it. And what does that scripture say? Because if it's about me, that scripture says right there that God will oppose me. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I don't ever want to hear God say to me, I'm going to oppose you. You're going to have a tough road to go when I say it's all about me and God says, okay, then I'll oppose you. 
We don't want that battle. Because you will lose. If I do it, I'll lose. Because God opposes the proud. And I think the biggest decision this morning goes back to what I just said. We have to choose. We have to choose. Not God. We have to choose if we want to place our faith in God or if we want to go about our own way. And if I decide to go on my own way and I'm going to be in charge, God says, I'm going to oppose it. But I can go along with God and place my faith in Him and He's going to show His grace to me. In every situation and in every step of my way, He will show grace because He loves us and because He is so proud of what His Son did on the cross for each and every one of us to show grace and mercy to us. And I would beg you this morning to place your faith in Him fall at his feet and say, you are my savior. You are my king. Forgive me of my sins. And every time God says, I'll do it. And I want to place my faith in you. And through that, I have a hope of eternity to where I'm simply just going to go to sleep one day and wake up in the presence of God. Where for eternity, I will spend my days just worshiping him. Will you stand? bow your heads God we love you so much God thank you for being gracious to us thank you for for forgiving us of our sins when we ask and then identifying with our misery God we love you so much in Jesus name amen this altar is open